Hey everybody, Larry Lawton here. I got a good video for you today. It's going to be about people who have life sentences in prison. Before I get started, check us out on YouTube member programs, Patreon member programs, Discord, the book, uh, Gangster Redemption, the uh, merch, all, all that kind of stuff. It would be great. Well, let me just get right to this video. This video was asked to me by a bunch of people. Of course, I didn't have a life sentence. In fact, when I was in Atlanta, we had uh, 800, I think it was 880 people with life sentences out of 2,000. What a life sentence means in the federal system is, they call it letters. That means you'll never ever get out of prison. Now, doing some research on life sentences, over 200,000 people around the United States and state, mostly in state prisons, with life sentences. 200,000. Most of those people will never ever see daylight. Now, don't get me wrong, some of them should never see daylight. Uh, some of the, the crimes that, that they committed are atrocious. Some of them aren't, and that's crazy. You know, I did my news show, and when I looked up crime and, and exonerations with uh, the guy Aziz, who, who, who who was uh, falsely convicted of killing Malcolm X. 3,000 people since 1989 were exonerated for falsely being, uh, falsely accused and falsely uh, imprisoned. 3,000 people, think of that number. That number is just atrocious to me. I mean, it's just, it boggles my mind to think of that. And I never even thought the number was that high myself. You know, when you go to prison, everybody thinks, oh, you know, you know, are, are, are they innocent or people, you always say, yes, there's going to be a few, but most of the people in prisons are not innocent. You know, it's funny. You know, I did a lot of legal work. Now, what I can say is doing legal work, a lot of people are probably overcharged or they're convicted under dubious conditions, meaning whether they were guilty or not, that that's really here or there by law. The feds didn't give exact all the evidence and release all the stuff and or the, the jury was wrong or the voir dire, which is jury questioning and stuff of that nature or even the jury instructions were uh, dubious at best. And uh, there's where good lawyers come, the technical end of it. Obviously, what I tell anybody who's ever going to get arrested, no matter what crime you're really facing, do your own research. If I didn't do my own research, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I was facing a life sentence. Well, I was facing 85 years for the gun charge alone. To me, that's a life sentence. 85 plus what I got, I would've got 90 something years in prison. I think that's a life sentence. Although they don't consider that a life sentence because there is a number, but in the federal system, you gotta do 85% of your time. So it's not like you're getting out, you know, you can say, oh, okay, you can get good time or the parole board will come at one third or anything like that doesn't work like that. There is no more parole board. Uh, they did away with all that, which I think they should bring back. Let me go into life sentence and people I know and met in, in prison. Now, I met a lot, a lot of life sentence guys, and I got to know them very well. And there's a couple of things I always noticed when I, when I talked to them about that. They really, they did their time. They didn't let time do them. I often talk about that. You do the time, don't let time do you. And most of them don't really talk about the outside at all. Even their families, they don't talk about much. Uh, you'll hear a few, and I got really close with a few, and, and something, you'll, you'll hear them, you know, when you get close to them, we'll talk about a kid. And I've seen them cry. I've seen them break down, but they try to keep that, that whatever it is that makes you live in prison. You know, after your appeals are done, most people in prison, of course, when they get to prison, if they have a life sentence, any sentences, they go for an appeal. After your appeal in prison, you still have other remedies to get back into court. And if you're in a state, you can go to the feds. And if you're in the feds, you can go with ineffective assistance of counsel, which is called a 2255. So there are ways to get back into court to try to remedy what happened to you. Not all of it works, some of it does. Obviously, after you do so much, I was with a guy, had a life sentence, and he was in the cell. In fact, uh, I was in a cell with a drug dealer and, and, and got in the prison, and this guy had life sentence. I knew him well, and he comes into the guy and he says to the guy, he goes, hey, listen, I need five papers of heroin. The guy looked at him like, what do you think, you're a jerk off? You he owed him money. He says, what are you fucking talking about? You owe me money, don't play me for a jerk off. The guy goes, listen, I'm checking out. I'm like, at first it didn't click, then it clicked. And the guy looked, and I'm like quiet, just sitting on a bunk, and he says, uh, I can't do it anymore. And the guy was probably 50 years old at that time. And sure enough, the guy gave him the heroin and said, you better be dead in the morning or I'm gonna kill you. And he meant it. I mean, this is real shit. Now this is shit I was there and I witnessed. The guy took the heroin 
and he overdosed that night. Uh, I've seen a lot of people overdose and come back, but a lot of people overdose in prison because in Atlanta and in most prisons, heroin is the number one drug and it, it fucking kills you, you know? I mean, people people are fucking, they shoot it and they, that's how they get dirty needles, and, but who gives a fuck? If you're at a point where you have life, do you really give a fuck? I mean, there's a percentage of the people in prison will keep fighting their cases for years five years, 10 years, they get into the law. I, I met him in the law library. We would talk about their case, other cases. They're always researching cases, new cases coming out, hoping the Supreme Court changes certain things. A whole bunch of stuff goes on, and uh, which I would too, obviously. But then there's a, a percentage of them who literally re get resigned to the fact that they are here for life. Now they'll get a lover, yes, a guy lover or whatever, and they'll go to work, they'll go to Unicor, they call it, or go whatever they work, and they'll go make money, and they'll come back, and they'll have dinner with their celly, which is their wife at that point, or whatever it is, whether it's under the table or not. Uh, most of them don't give a fuck. What do you give a fuck? Got life in prison? Who am I to judge any? I don't judge anyone anyway to, to do what anybody does. You know, hey, good for them. Whatever you're gonna do, you do. You know, there's an old saying we used to say, what goes on in prison stays in prison. But, uh, these guys literally, literally just get a life. Now, that is resigning yourself to, I'm never getting out of here. This is the best life I can make for myself. And I often used to think about that, always having a date. I always had a date. So when you have a date, you look at things a whole different way. You know, my, my worry was always that people who didn't have a date are looking at me like getting jealous, you know, uh, fuck him. You know, Although they don't say it, most people are like happy that you get out, you get transferred, you're getting close, you win an appeal, everybody is like that. But some, I mean, they're just people are crazy. Then, I often say you do have a percentage of the life sentence people that are just fucking crazy. They really don't belong in, in the free world. They probably don't even belong in a regular prison. They're freaking mental. When I say mental, I mean off the fucking charts. I, I knew them, and I would hang, even hang with some of them, and... But you always had your eyes behind your head opened, uh, or you hear things, or you watch things, you see the demeanor of people change. I also learned like when you see them change, even what they talk about. I mean, I've watched a, a number of suicides in prison, and uh, you'll see them start talking about different things, and before you know it, you hear about, oh, he was down in B House, and you know he hung himself or he killed himself. Obviously, the first thing we all think, did he really do that? You know, I mean, because we've seen the cases where. Let me tell you that the questionable stuff of what goes on in prison, meaning, listen, they took a guy off a fucking, down off a freaking, hanging off a top bunk, but he had a hole in his head. How the fuck can you put a hole in your head and then fucking hang yourself? So I don't, I, I don't know what happened there, obviously. Uh, you know, the, the system is pretty broke and nobody, the sad part is not many people care about these people who are of life sentences. Now, when you get down to it, uh, you, a lot of people look at this and say, why should I? Some of them killed fucking kids or old people or fucking were just, you know, the worst of the world. And that is true. I made it a point of mine not to know what people did. Usually I didn't care unless I did their legal work or I'm really, really close with them. I didn't give a fuck what anybody, I didn't want to know what people did. That, that was my way of coping and saying, hey, listen, I'm just going to keep my counsel to myself, what I believe and what, what happens. I dealt with shot callers, so I would find out a lot about what people did because the shot callers, which is the leader of X amount, whatever group it is, they'd say, hey, lad, can you do us a favor? Can you get the paperwork on this guy or that guy? And I did, so then I would know, and some of the shit I read was just fucking disgusting. And, uh, you know, it gave me the, like, wow. I'm, and, I, and I thought many, many times I'm sitting in these places, I'm living with these people, literally eating with them, living with them. Uh, who knows, the guy down at the corner, who knows how sick of a crime he committed or whatnot. But I also know I've met some really, really good people in prison. And uh, whether it's a Paul Tolini or a Big Ron, got to get Big Ron on here. Ron, to this day, man, I met him, you know, when I was out, since I've been out, when I went to Vegas once, I met him, we went to the Hoover Dam. and all. Ron is just one of the sweetest guys, great guy, stand-up guy. Uh, he'll have stories about me, too. But uh, so I met good people. There's no question I met some good people. But you do meet people you never want to see again. You, you just want to do your time and get away from these people for whatever reason or not because they're fucking not right in the head and you never know what can happen to them or what you're going to do. And I had a cellmate who was a life sentence guy 
And you know, everybody used to say to me when I started doing this, they'd say, oh, Larry, you say, oh, and he's a good guy. Yes, he was a good guy. He killed the guy with an ax handle on a military base. I don't know the whole particulars of why that, I think it was a robbery or something gone bad or whatever it was, And but he was a good guy. I hung with him, I partied with him, listened to music with him, talked to him. Nice guy, really was. And I, you know, isn't that crazy? You say, well, he was a nice guy, he killed a guy. But you know, I'm not judging that whole guy's whole life on that one incident. I hope nobody judges me on the, the incidents that happened to me and when I was a bad guy, because I was a bad guy. I never try to tell people I was a great guy and, oh, Larry was, a, you know, just got mixed up in a little robbery here. No, I was a bad guy. I was wrapped up with the wrong people. I, I was fucking balls to my knees. I, I was crazy. I never thought I'd live to 50 years old, no less now. So, I mean, I'm looking at it a different way and I do look at people that way now. I look at, I look at people in that good way of, hey, listen, everybody shouldn't be judged on the worst of their acts. They shouldn't. They should be judged in the totality of their act. I hope people realize that I try to help people. I try to make people better. I try to make young people not make the choices I make. I try to give people who've been in prison that step up to say, hey, listen, if Larry can do it, anybody can do it, because it's true. I never came from money. I never come from stuff. When I got out, I had it rough, everything else, and I want you to know that you can make it. People can make it. It's not like you, know, you can't. Yes, you're gonna have hurdles, all the time, what I tell you about an asshole, probation, whatever it is, half a house going back, doing everything, but you can make it. The life sentence people, now these people are never ever getting out. I mean, the mentality of it is crazy. A guy who has a life sentence, if he gets mad, there is no question he's gonna try to do something to you and kill you. He doesn't think it a consequence. What are they gonna do to him? Put him in the hole? Transfer him? You know, I, I dealt with a kid with a life sentence, he had three life sentences, and he was a great kid. And how I, I helped him become a bookie. I know it's crazy, but he become a bookie. And and when he was wanted to kill somebody, I, I grabbed him, I said, hey, come here, you know, listen to me. Do you like this place? Well, yeah, yeah, I do like it. What do you, he, he was making money, had guards in the pocket, doing everything. Do you like it? Yeah, yeah. I said, if you do something, you're gonna get transferred, you're out of here. That's the the best. He might go to what they call ADX, Colorado, and then get into what they call the step down program, if he even can get that far. Or, but they're gonna transfer you for a while. They're not just throwing anybody into the ADX. They don't have the beds just to do that either. But these guys who, who have a life, they think of things a little different. You gotta understand what makes them tick. He liked the prison, he, he had the yard, he knew the people, he, he was you know entrenched in that place. So he knows, he's been transferred many times, and, and now, do you want to get transferred again? Do you want to lose what you got? Do you want to lose your hustle? Do you want to lose everything you got? Maybe your family knows you're, you're, you're here now, and, and you can visit here, or it's closer, or whatever the reasons. You have to find out what that person, I did at least when I talked to them, and, that, and I always had to walk on that balance of, listen to me, you know, I don't have a life sentence. So when you're talking to a guy with a life sentence, you gotta wonder, is he gonna look like, who the fuck are you, Lawton? What do you tell him? I never did it like that, because I always try to educate whoever it was I was with, even life sentence guys with what I knew, my knowledge, whether it was bookmaking, loan sharking, or whatever illegal act I did, how to do things better, how to figure things out. Maybe it's just the way my mind works, but that's what I did to try to help them realize that, hey, there is more to, Yes, you got a life sentence, but you like it here. You know, it's funny, you know, I remember being in a in a uh, TV room and we had, we were, there were about three guys who had life, life. It was myself and maybe another two guys. <laughs> we were watching a movie that, I don't know what the freaking movie it was, it made us cry, literally. You're seeing these fucking badass, crazy motherfuckers cry. I mean, you know, they try to act tough and you'll see a tear, you go, you know, you see go somebody go like that or during a movie or whatever it was. And I, I thought afterwards, I says, what do you think? Someone would come in there and say, hey, what are you crying over a movie? Fuck no. Every one of those guys in that TV room, I knew for a fact had a shank on them. Those guys, I knew guys who never left their cell without a shank. I used to have a shank ready to go, but I didn't have to carry it at all times. I didn't think I did, and thank God I didn't. Because once you get caught with a shank, you're going right to the hole. You're gonna get a shot, you're gonna lose good time, and you're not gonna get down to the level of prison you wanna get down. My goal was always to get to a medium. I did, but then I fucked up and went back to the penitentiary. It's just because your mentality is so different. You know, when you're with life sentence guys, when you're with the respect you have on a, a prison yard of a penitentiary, 
it's a lot different than, than going to a lower level prison, whatever it is. But the, even the prisons I went to, they're lower. They, they were either a gang unit or a new prison, and it was pretty wild. I never got down to a low or a camp or anything like that. I, I can't even imagine me being in there and some guy fucking crying about his three years he got in prison. I think I fucking slapped the shit out of him. Because, I mean, shut your fucking mouth, especially in prisons. <laughs> Listen, I had four 12-year sentences running concurrent, meaning they run consec you know, together, and I never mentioned anyone I had 144 months. Never. Because you you'd get guys who got... 240 months is 20 years. They'd have 240 months, it was like nothing. Then, of Ken, once a guy has life, it literally is life. There's no number. It is life. You die in that prison. You will never get out of prison unless you die. And that's just the way the system, federal system is. There is no parole. There is no, you try to do what you can legally, but life is not. And the demeanor of the people who have life, most of them are pretty quiet. Most of them are, I guess, in their own thoughts. Uh, obviously, suicides, uh, obviously, drugs, obviously, whatever it is, and it, the, depending on the level of the person, and you got to know. Listen, we played sports, and I played sports with some life sentence. That's what their their life was, you know, to win that title on the yard, or to beat another team, or to to play and go, you know, hit a baseball. You know, so we played softball, not baseball play softball or play uh, handball. There were some great, great handball. I mean, great handball players. And that's what their life became is, is that exertion and maybe it's getting out that that exercise. I was a big physical guy where I did a lot of push-ups and pull-ups and dips on stairs. Everything I did, I used to be, a, 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 that's how I got energy out of me when I got mad or frustrated and stuff. And I always had something going on. Just That's just my nature. I can't not keep busy. I can't not connect. Even now, I can't not connect with my YouTube audience or I can't not answer stuff on, on videos. Or I, can't, I, I just love to be active. I'm not the kind of guy can ever sit down and retire. That's not Larry. It's just maybe someday it will, but it's not now. That's for sure. And it was not then either. It wasn't back in those days either. It was not even close to that. I was the kind of guy that had to be involved in things. Now, some of these life sins, guys, become zombies. I've seen that. Literally zombies. Some of them get on medications at the medical, because they all can get medication immediately. I mean, you know how much depression's got to be involved when you got a life sentence and never getting out? I mean, they get antidepressants and what they call the Thorazine. You see a guy do a Thorazine shuffle, he's all fucked up. He's like a zombie. And so you'd see all that kind of stuff. And some of them would even get it to try to sell it, to get money, to get stuff off the commissary. Some of them lose everything. I don't know their cases. I don't know why they lost everyone, why they lost family. I was always blessed to have family and friends that would support me. Even when I went away, they supported me in a big way, which is very, very important when you're in prison. So that made me always, if you want to call it happy, happy. But again, there's a big difference. I didn't have a life sentence. The lifers that I was around, I noticed the main thing they I, I don't re ever remember them talking about the outside. Like, I could be with a friend who we're both getting out, and we're talking, oh man, when I get out, I'm gonna try this. I, you know, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. You don't do that around guys who are never ever getting out. I mean, I, I mean, you'd see it, and they'd be up and they'd walk away. And I've never seen them like live in the outside world. They lived in their little bubble, that bubble of the prison. That prison was their world forever. And it, it, you know, it actually boggles my mind, just like people who are death row, you know, on, on death row and, or people in life. I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I'd want to do it. I, they say the will to live is just amazing. And I get that because I was in the hole for 11 straight months, three years out of my time. And I thought I was going to die. And there was no question. I, you know, I thought about suicide. I thought about a lot of those things. But I was at that, you know, like point, and I, I can imagine if I had never ever, all appeals are lost, all ready to go, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can sit there and want this for the rest of my life ever. Unless you just, like I said, I've seen them fall into it and get, get it, like I said, get their lover, go eat at night, make soups, you know, make all the stuff I talk about on here. Actually, I got a video coming out about another meal. But all of that kind of stuff, and it, it, it just boggles my mind that they can compartmentalize. But again, 
they snap. And I can understand it, but the common denominator is they never talk about the outside world. I never heard them, I never sat down with life sentence guys and they start talking about their family out there. Or, you know, you know the kids, I just never did. I'm sure they had them, they did it, and I'd see them go for visits. But I never saw them like come back like all happy, like, hey, great guy, you know, how I hate it. Visits were the roughest time in prison because, you know, you get so psyched up to get a visit, you get it, and then it's like a big letdown. Could you imagine if you, you're seeing somebody and then you know you're never ever gonna see him again? How do you talk to them out there? I, that would always, you know, I always wanted to ask one, but you, you don't do that. I wouldn't do that, I never did. And I always respected the time they had to do. Now, I've watched drug dealers that I help in the law. I'm, I had some pretty big kingpins who had life prison, and they'd ask me for help in law, and I got to know them. We'd sit down. It was all law, though. It was all legal. It was all their case, what they did, who's the snitches, how do you get them, what they say was wrong, not wrong, how did the lawyer fuck up, everything else. So it was all legal. So we did legal work, and that's how we worked with those guys. So I hope I gave you a little bit of an insight of life sentences. I just hope I gave you a little bit, enough to realize, think about that. 200, over 200,000 people in the United States with life, never getting out. Think about that. Uh, you, you'll be surprised a lot of countries don't have that. Uh, a lot of countries have a number and then they can get parole or whatever. The United States doesn't have that. So think about that and think about our system. And I'm not saying again, I'm not sticking up for life people because some of them did atrocious things and i want to say that as well but i hope you like my insight into life people with life sentences inside if you like what we do please pass it on please subscribe if you haven't have a great day please make good choices and please please help somebody along the way it'll make you feel good i know it makes me feel good when i do that have a great day everybody